For a long time, my book, Beyond Words, had the name Aristotle's Cough in my mind. I didn't think it would have been a good title, but I called it Aristotle's Cough in my mind because the whole thing started from thinking about a very funny little passage in which Aristotle, who was writing at the time about the soul and about the place of the voice in expressing soul, says, although the voice is the sound of something that has soul in it, not all the sounds that are part of the voice have themselves got soul in them. And he gives the example of a cough. He says the cough is a sound that's made by the voice, but it's not a sort of soulful sound. It's not a meaningful sound. It's just, it's just air battering against the side of um, your bronchial tubes. And I thought about this for a long time. And, um, and as is usually the case, the interesting thing about this is that, of course, it's completely false, actually. Uh, there are plenty of actors who are able to make coughs very soulful indeed. And so I then began thinking, well, what, why is it and in what ways is the, the cough expressive? And, and what does it mean when we have a word in English like the word ahem, A-H-E-M, which is a word for a sound which isn't a word. When you say discreetly ahem to attract somebody's attention, you're, you're really saying I'm not actually saying anything, I'm, I'm just here, I'm not saying anything, but, but oh, I seem to be here. Um, so it's a word for a sound that isn't a word. And that got me thinking about a whole range of different kinds of sounds that, that are perfectly well established within language. They operate within language, they have their functions. But they also have the function of signifying a sort of pure, a-verbal, non-semantic, noisiness. And that's how Beyond Words came about, as a series of studies of different kinds of noises that we make as part of the process of speaking to each other, um, that often become ways for us to reflect in language about language that seems somehow to be beside itself, or to be going beyond itself, or somehow maybe falling short of being articulate language. Think of a word like patter, for example. I have a chapter in the book about the letter T and the sound T. Uh, the word patter, which is an onomatopoeic word that means to make a sound like pattering, like rain does, um, is also a word that is applied to a particular kind of uh, whispered, hurried prayer. And it comes from the fact that um, priests would, would say the pater noster, the Our Father, in that way. So the Pater, the father, you know, one of the most uh, uh, one of the most imperious words that we have in English becomes an entirely trivial word. The sound of patter, pure patter. And when we talk about conjurers, patter, magicians, patter, uh, it derives from the same thing. There are lots of sounds that I think about in the book that seem to have as their principal function the blocking or the obstruction of sound or articulate speech as such. The best example, I suppose, of this, the most expressive example, are the sounds associated with the bilabial nasal, which surprisingly enough is how we describe the sound mmm, because all the sound is actually coming through your nose, it can't come out anywhere else. And the fact is that the only sound you can really make when your mouth is full is a sound that comes through your nose, a sound mmm, and that's Probably why it is that in many languages across the world, not all, but in many languages, the word for mother involves an M sound because presumably of our association with that condition of delicious repletion in which all we can say is a sort of murmur, a murmur of content or satisfaction. And it's why we say mmm when we are eating something very delicious. It's a sound, it's a noise that somehow is saying, this is too wonderful for words. Mm. Another sound that I think about is the sound of buzzing. Buzzing is a very interesting thing for human beings. Human beings are very interested in inchoate sounds. So you get a kind of buzzing, uh, for example, in the case of insect sounds was great mystery for, for centuries, actually, as to how flies and bees made their 
buzzing sound. Uh, some people thought it was made with their mouth parts, some with their legs, some by rubbing their wings. It's a very mysterious, kind of unplaced sound. And there's something about buzzing and the related sound of humming um, that is also similarly out of tune, uh, just, just as it were, um, to the side of the station. Uh, the buzzing of a crowd, for example. And when buzzing gets into our language through the letter Z, it often has that kind of function, the function of suggesting something that is uh, uh, inchoate, perhaps really quite exciting, as one talks about a buzz of excitement, um, but also it has associations very often of a kind of hazy, mazy intoxication. So the, the buzz of a drug or a stimulant. Lots of people have thought about uh, the sounds of language um, in the past and the tendency has been to assume that there are certain hardwired patterns, that there are certain meanings that get linked to certain sounds. Um, and there seems to be good reason for this, although some of the linkages are really rather mysterious. English, for example, seems to uh, recurrently to make an association between words that begin with GL and light. Glint, gleam, glow. Even a word like gloom, which is a word for the absence of light, somehow seems vaguely lit up by the GL. Now there's nothing intrinsic about the letters GL or the sound glur that, that really justifies any association with light. The reason is that there are, there just seem to be other words in the vicinity that form what has been called a phonesthetic constellation uh, that most of us would not really be able to articulate, but we kind of have a sense for. We kind of have a sense for, for example, when we make up words. And it looks as though, in a weird way, language on our behalf uh, has a sense for it as well, because this is the way in which words tend to get formed. There's a wonderful New Yorker cartoon that I quote in the book, which has two tigers. One of them is saying to the other, growl, grim, grisly. What other good words are there in GR? <laughs>